Okay, so final um, talk of the day is from Steve Brotherhood, uh, looking at personal learning networks. And I can't get the slides to work, Nigel, so I'm hoping you might be able to help as you did earlier. Okay, I think that's working. Hello. Um, so uh, I'm the, uh, the graveyard shift, um, just before the beer. Um, <clears throat> and uh, just wanted to talk to you a bit about um, a project I've been doing for several years, which started as an ED project at the University of Reading um, and has continued on um, since then. I also want to do a shameless plug before I get going for nothing. It's not related to my um, talk, but I'm also leading a, a project called the Eat Erasmus Project which is about developing um, resources and support for um, assessment and feedback. It's a European wide um, project. So if you'd like to, we don't have the website up just yet. Um, so if you'd like to be kept informed, that's the uh, um, site to go to. And that QR code will appear on all my slides because I'm plugging shamelessly um, as I go through. I'm really interested in how students develop self-regulated learning skills. There's various different models of self-regulated learning, but most of them tend to focus around three key areas. The regulation of cognitive strategies, so how you learn, um, what the approaches you're taking to learning and how successful they are, those are. Metacognitive strategies, how you evaluate whether those, work, those strategies are working or not, um, whether they're being effective. And the motivational or the effective domain, which is what are your goals for um, studying in the first place? What are your motivations for doing that? This is um, one of many models by Molly Burkhart. I quite like it because it's a series of concentric rings. I'm going to very arrogantly um, amend that towards the end of my, my talk. Hopefully, we'll have time. Um, so the methodology of the approach I use is qualitative, which for me as a, as a bioscientist was quite interesting as an approach. Um, but I uh, deliberately wanted to do it that way. And actually, I've, I'm a convert into that area. So um, overall, I've involved a large number of students. I started off with chemistry, history, and English students. Since then, I've done medical, medical students as well. I've um, also got a large number of student projects, final year undergraduate projects that are developed to. And the bioscience ones I did for my initial project were part of the pilot um, study I did. There were open intensive interviews um, throughout year one at three different points throughout year one. By open intensive, I mean I would ask open questions like, can you tell me about your experience of, rather than asking them direct questions. And then, um, so the little numbers at the back are the ones I've then followed throughout their degree. And it's interesting to see how they develop through years two, three, and four. The analytical approach I took was a grounded theory approach. The idea of that is you go into the data without having any expectations of what you're going to get out of it. So you go in and you code, you identify items that look interesting, items that look significant. And you've got your open questions, you get your, your data, and you essentially have a conversation with the person you're interviewing. Then you code the transcript with no preconception of what you're going to get out of it. You're just getting a whole load of um, different themes that pop out. Then you group those into clusters, you cluster those into um, themes and categories, and you sort of work out the, your, what's going on with the subject um, through that. You then design new questions, follow up questions, and then do the whole process again. I particularly followed um, Kathy Charmitz's idea of constructivist grounded theory, which is where you don't isolate yourself as a researcher from that process. That's impossible for me to do because I am a university lecturer, I have been a student, I cannot forget everything I know in my experience um, when I'm analysing and interpreting um, the things that the students say to me. I can use it to inform um, my interpretations of them. Cut a long story short, um, this is one model I put together to show um, the progression that students go um, through the process of what I call learning the rules of the game. Fits in very much with what Michelle was saying earlier. Um, so the experience I had talking to these students was they went through three transition stages. The first one was becoming an independent adult. So in most cases, they were living away from home for the first time. They were um, experiencing a different city, sometimes a different country, a different language, different culture. Um, and they spent a while fitting into that. As Michelle said earlier, it's not about induction. Ha doesn't happen in week naught. It's a long process. The second one, the, uh, the, 
activities in blue uh, is learning to be a university learner, learning to study in a higher education context. Most of the students, when they came to university, didn't know what was expected of them at university. It took them a long time to understand what we expected of them, and that's a key thing um, I think we need to address more actively, again, as, as Michelle and other people have, have mentioned earlier today. Finally, when they've done all that, then they can embed themselves in the discipline. Then they can start to understand what it means to be a bioscientist, a historian, a chemist, um, a philosopher, a, uh, a doctor. The key thing about that is that those transitions take time. And the longer they take in these earlier transitions, the longer they take to the discipline and learning what they're supposed to be doing as a scientist, as a historian, as a, a philosopher or, or whatever. And you can see this, and you can see that realization happening at different time points. And don't worry too much about the, uh, the words in this, but these are just three examples of three students. And they happen to be English students, English literature students, um, but the same is true for um, science students. They, these are the three interviews and things they felt um, talked about in those interviews. The asterisk shows when it clicks for them what they were supposed to be doing as a higher education student. So, Fion was actually a very nervous student. She came from widening access, uh, access sort of background, first um, generation um, university student. She's actually a mother as well, a young mother. Um, very, very unsure of herself as a learner. She got it straight away. She understood, yeah, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be analytical, critical. I'm supposed to disagree with my, um, with my lecturers. For Mary, it happened somewhere in the middle of semester two. Jane, who was actually academically very gifted, um, very, very sharp, she didn't get it at all until the beginning of, of year two. At the end of year three, she was still saying, why am I being asked to read 10 books when my essay is based on one of them? At the beginning of year two, she went, ah, I get it now, I'm supposed to understand the body of literature. Uh, it's quite difficult when you're interviewing someone going, why don't you understand? Um, so, but I think we have a, a, a strong role to play in that. And, and this is a little model I put together from the data so showing the different influences that can help students understand the rules of the game. So you've got your year one student there. As lecturers, as teachers, we have a role and it's about little and often. Not saying, you know, a three hour introductory lecture doesn't help anyone, but if you mention little bits as you go along, gradually um, seeps through. The staff who are supporting them in a pastoral sense, in an academic pastoral sense, so a personal tutor, mentor, whatever you call them, that enables reciprocal dialogue between you and the student. We need to keep reinforcing what our expectations are of the student. Postgraduate tutors, postgraduate demonstrators have a role to play in that. And also other students have as well, both their peers on their course and the students they live with. And that leads me on to the other part of uh, what I wanted to talk about. I'm also really interested in how students interact with each other, how students engage with each other in peer learning situations. Again, don't worry about the words in, in this, it's almost too small to read, um, but there's general trends you've got here. So this is just a non, this isn't, um, what's the word, quantitative in any way. So don't take the scale as, you know, this is double, this is double that or anything. But it's a general trend along the bottom of students who, when they came to university, tended to collaborate in their uh, learning activities. And the vertical axis is students who, before they came to university, tended to collaborate in their activities. So Kate, for example, she and a small group of others, these are all pseudonyms, by the way, um, taught themselves their A-levels, essentially, because their school was, was useless. So they pretty much taught themselves through as a group. What's really interesting is there's no one there. So you had students who are very collaborative before they came to university, but not at university. You had students who were collaborative at university, but weren't previously. And you had students that weren't collaborative at all. There weren't students who were just really collaborated in collaborative individuals. And I was really interested as to why that might be. What came out of a lot of this study was the importance of personal learning networks. And this is a model for a personal learning network. Personal learning network is the sources of information around you that you get information from. It can be people. If I want to, if I've got a problem with my car, the first person I call is my dad. 
Um, if I've got a problem with my dog, the first person I call is my partner who's had dogs um, forever. It could be technologies, you know, YouTube or um, the, the web. It could be um, groups of people. It could be actions, activities, social relationships, whatever. I did a bit of analysis to look and see what those relationships were. This is a ridiculously complex um, image that you won't get anything from, except that it shows all different sorts of things that impact um, upon a student. To simplify that down, the impact on the student's learning, if you look, if you talk to them and, and get this from their, uh, um, from interviews, the most interaction you have is with their domestic peers. So students they share accommodation with in year one are the ones that have the most impact on their development um, as a learner. Their academic peers, depending on the subject, have a lot less um, impact. For medical students, which are a much more cohesive group, there's more impact. For English and humanities students, there's almost, you know, almost no impact. Science students, because they work together in practicals and some group work have a bit more impact. But in most cases, it's the domestic peers. We have almost no impact on them whatsoever in terms of their learning development, which is quite depressing. So if you then try and sort of supervise, superimpose those elements onto um, that personal learning network um, map, then you see that most of those things I identified in that mapping um, activity fit within those different um, areas. And so I really wanted just to emphasize the importance for students developing of having those personal learning networks of, and helping them develop them because they establish them very well when they're at school. They know exactly who to go to for help with maths, who to go to for help with spelling, who to go to for help with grammar, who to go to um, if they need to fix their bike or whatever. They come to university, it's an entirely new group of people. So one thing I think we need to spend a, a bit of time developing is helping those students identify where they go to to get help from each other, from us, from the university, and so on. And not just help when they're in crisis, but help with their development. Got a little um, model here, um, which shows what I think are the key elements to developing an effective personal learning network. So there's the prior experience they have. Were they collaborative at school or not? Personal factors, what kind of personality are they? Are they an extrovert, an introvert? Are they someone who's naturally inquisitive or naturally um, um, quite reticent? The academic factors, how invested are they in the course? How um, academically um, capable are they? On the right-hand side, types of technologies they use, are they um, good at looking things up independently? Um, here we've got um, the types of collaborative activities that are encouraged um, in their degree course, and then the types of communal activities and impersonal, interpersonal relationships they have, either with their domestic peers or their academic peers. And so, very last thing, I kind of think that rather than self-regulated learning as a concept, I prefer the term student-mediated learning, because I think there's another ring that goes around that, which is regulation of interaction with others, which impacts on all of the other concentric rings on the inside. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Steve, um, I'm just gonna go one quick question from Tablet, uh, which is, do you see group effects in the peer interactions with groups pushing themselves and developing positive behavior and groups normalizing behavior that's not this? Um, that's a very good question. Um, yes. Um, so you see different types of behaviours when you talk to them about the personal groups they have in their accommodations and, and with their friend groups. Their friend groups change, obviously, and they um, often migrate completely from one group to another. Um, but there are some groups that reinforce negative, what we would perceive as negative um, behaviours. Um, but it's so interesting that often students can identify that and will migrate out of those groups if they feel those behaviours are negative. Or continue to support that group, but not actually gain support from that group. So they act as sort of like a donor and gain cultural capital by doing that, but they don't actually interact that much more. Very interesting question. 